Welcome to the Edgar Rice Burroughs mini podcast, episode two. These short podcasts are a subset of the full length podcasts that I do along with Jess Terrell and Scott Stewart about the works of Edgar Rice Burroughs, the greatest storyteller of the 20th century. My name is Tim DeForest. I'm the author of several books about the pulp magazines, old time radio, and other aspects of pre-digital pop culture. And I am here today to talk about a few vehicles that exist in the Edgar Rice Burroughs uh, universe that are just noteworthy for being particularly awesome and cool. Uh, now, there are actually a number of cool vehicles that appear in a number of, uh, of uh, Burroughs's work. Uh, for instance, in The Land That Time Forgot, a lot of the action takes place aboard a World War I-era German U-boat. Uh, the sequel to that, The People That Time Forgot, uh, includes an airplane that's transported to the lost continent of Kaspak in the Antarctic uh, by boat, is assembled on the water, and then launched from the water to fly over the insurmountable cliffs that normally make Kaspak inaccessible. Uh, of course, after the hero flying it, Tom Billings, gets to Kaspak, he's almost immediately knocked out of the sky by a pteranodon. That happens to a plane in Tarzan at the Earth's core as well. So... Note to, note, everybody note to yourselves that if you're ever visiting the Edgar Rice Burroughs universe and you're in a dinosaur, in or near a dinosaur infested land, do not go flying. It's just always a bad idea. Now the specific vehicles I want to talk today about today are from uh, Tarzan at the Earth's core from 1929, from at the Earth's core from 1914, and from Savage Pellucidor, which was uh, one of the later novels set also in the uh, um, At the Earth's Core series. So all of these vehicles either traveled to or existed in uh, the world of Pellucidor, the, uh, the world that exists inside the hollow earth. Um, and that just happens, probably by coincidence, to be where the three coolest vehicles in the Edgar Rice Burroughs universe exist. Uh, now, that is, of course, a subjective opinion. The flying craft of Mars, uh, the uh, vehicle from uh, uh, beyond the farthest star, and, uh, well, I could go on. There are a lot of cool vehicles in the Edgar Rice Burroughs universe. These just happen to be three of my favorites. And the first, from Tarzan at the Earth Core, written in 1929, is the O220, a uh, Zeppelin that is built almost entirely out of harbonite, a newly discovered very lightweight metal that's also very strong. And therefore it's ideal to construct a uh, lighter than aircraft like a Zeppelin. The O220 is built so that Tarzan and its crew can go on a rescue mission into the Earth's core, into the hollow Earth, uh, through an opening they know exists near the North Pole in, uh, in order to rescue David Innes from, uh, from the people who have captured him. David Innes is the uh, man from the surface who has traveled to Pellucidor and uh, now controls an empire there. Uh, but he's been captured by bad guys. When Tarzan and friends get a radio message that this is the case, they launch this rescue mission. Now here from Tarzan at the Earth's core is a description of the O220. Quote, the, the great cigar-shaped hull of the O220 was 997 feet in length and 150 feet in diameter. The interior of the hull was divided into six large airtight compartments, three of which run the full length of the, of the ship, uh, three of which running the full length of the ship were above the medial line and three below. Inside the hull and running alongside uh, the ship, alongside each side of the ship, uh, between the upper and lower vacuum tanks were long corridors in which were located the engines, motors, and pumps, in addition to supplies of gasoline and oil. Now the main cabin running along the keel of the ship was an integral part of the hull. And because of this entirely rigid construction, which eliminated the necessity for cabins suspended below the hull, the, U2, the uh, O220 was equipped with landing gear in the form of six large, heavily tired wheels projected below the bottom of the main cabin. In the extreme stern of the keel cabin, a small scout monoplane was carried in such a way that it could be lowered through the bottom of the ship and launched while the O220 was in flight. 
That's unquote. Now, in addition to this, there are gun turrets both in the, uh, uh, the forward part of the hull and near the tail of the ship. Uh, so the O220 is pretty heavily armed. It's also capable of dropping bombs, which eventually is how they rescue uh, David Innes by threatening to just bomb their captors into oblivion unless they, unless they let him go. Uh, the engines of the O220 can generate 5,600 uh, 5, horsepower, and it's capable of traveling at 105 miles per hour. Um, it can maneuver very quickly through a uh, bank of, of eight air valves operated from the control panel cabin at the forward end of the keel. Um, it has pumps that can rapidly uh, uh, expel air from the tanks when it becomes necessary to renew the vacuum there. Um, and it, uh, um, it's just a cool ship. It really is. Uh, and this is the uh, Great Rigid Airship, I'm quoting again from this, the novel, quote, the Great Rigid Airship in which Jason Gridley and Tarzan of the Apes hope to discover the North Polar entrance to the inner world and rescue David Innes, Emperor of the Pellucidor, from the dungeons of the Corsars, unquote. Uh, now that is just a cool vehicle, and as good a novel as Tarzan at the Earth's Core is, it's really one of my favorites. Um, I, I was always a little bit disappointed that the O220 doesn't, pay, doesn't play a more active part in the bulk of the story. Uh, most of the story involves Tarzan and Drayson Gridley as co-heroes, separated from the O220, getting into dangers, uh, Jason Gridley uh, uh, meeting a... Uh, um, Pelucidorian girl he falls in love with and uh, them having various adventures mostly separate from each other and then eventually together before they reconnect with the O220 and complete their rescue mission. So it is a really cool vehicle. I just wish we'd seen a little bit more of it. But um, let's go back to the 1914 novel At the Earth's Core and take a look at the Iron Mole. This is how David Innes and the most cre uh, inventor, Abner Perry, got from the surface to Pellucidor in the first place. Um, David owned a mining company, and Perry worked for him, and Perry had developed the Iron Mole. And here is the uh, description of it uh, from the original novel, quote, Roughly, it is a steel cylinder, 100 feet long, and jointed so that it may turn and twist through solid rock if need be. At one end is a mighty revolving drill operated by an engine which Perry said generated more power to the cubic inch than any other engine uh, did the, to the cubic foot. I, this is being narrated by David Innes, I remember that he used to claim that the invention alone would make us fabulously wealthy if we were going to make the whole thing public after the successful issue of our first secret trial. But Perry never returned from that trial trip, and I only after 10 years. And the fact that they didn't return is as awesome as the Iron Mole is, it didn't work perfectly in one very important way. So once David and Perry started drilling down through the earth, they discovered that they weren't able to steer it. The, the, the steering mechanism couldn't generate enough force to change their direction. So they just kept going down, 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 till they eventually broke through into Pellucidor, um, encountered um, savage half-men, uh, dinosaurs, intelligent telepathic evil pterodactyls who ate people, and other various dangers before David was able to uh, marry the woman he had fallen in love with, Dean the Beautiful, and set up an empire. Um, he eventually brought the Iron Mole back up to the surface one more time and then down to pick up supplies, uh, mostly rifles, to help his, to keep his empire straight and uh, uh, safe, and then went back down to Pellucidor with it. And as far as I know, the Iron Mole is still down there today. I suspect that Abner Perry is keeping it uh, in good repair, but I don't believe it's been used again. Uh, but later on in the novel Savage Pellucidor, one of the later novels in the uh, Pellucidor series, we, we run across one other awesome vehicle. This one's more primitive than the others. And by itself, it's not remarkable, but uh, what it's built out of, what it's made out of rather, is what makes it remarkable. Um, and here we are, and this is set during a time where David's empire is fairly stable. He's off uh, having an adventure of his own. And back home, quoting from the novel Savage Pellucidor, Abner Perry busied himself on a new project. 
He was determined to have something worthwhile to show Innes when he returned, for he was still a little depressed over the single failure of his aerial plane. He had tried to build an airplane and hadn't been able to, with the facilities he had available to him in a pre-industrial pre -industrial civilization. Uh, back to quoting from the novel. He set hunters out to slay dinosaurs, the largest they could find, with orders to bring back only the peritonea of those he killed. And while they were gone, he succeeded in capping a gas well, which had been blowing millions of cubic feet of natural glass into the air of Pellucidor for, well, who knows how long. He had many women braiding rope and others weaving uh, a large basket, a basket four feet in diameter and three feet high. It was the largest basket the Sarians had ever seen. While this work was going on, the messenger arrived, oh, sorry, we're going to quit that, skip that uh, paragraph and get back to the main point here. The peritonea, the dinosaur stomach lion, lining, was stretched and dried and rubbed until they were, in, they were thoroughly cured. Then Perry cut, cut them into strange shapes according to a pattern he had fashioned. And the women sewed them together with very fine stitches and sealed the seams with a cement that Perry had thought would not be attacked by the constituents of natural gas. When this work was complete, Perry attached the great bag to the basket with the ropes the women had braided, and to the bottom of the basket he attached a heavier rope uh, that was five or six hundred feet long. No one in Sari had ever seen a rope like that, but they had long since ceased to marvel much about anything that Perry did. With little ropes, many little ropes, Perry fastened the basket to the ground by means of pegs driven into the earth all around it. Then he ran a clay pipe from the gas well into the opening at the small end of the bag. Perry had given birth to the balloon. To him, it was the forerunner of a fleet of mighty dirigibles that would carry tons of high-explosive bombs and bring civilization to countless underprivileged uh, cliff dwellers. So Perry... Uh, despite existing in a pre-industrial civilization, succeeds in making a high, hot air balloon out of the linings of uh, the stomach linings of dinosaurs. And that is the most epically cool hot air balloon that has ever been built. Now, of course, things go awry. Dion the Beautiful, David's, uh, uh, David's wife, insists on going up in the balloon. The inexperienced people uh, holding the balloon ropes uh, let the rope run out without realizing it, and the balloon floats free, and Dion has a bunch of uh, adventures in a far, the far country she ends up to in before getting home again. Um, and that's all cool by itself, but just the fact that Perry made a hot air balloon out of dinosaur stomach linings is just epically cool in of itself. And anyway, as I mentioned, that's just my very subjective opinion of the coolest vehicles uh, that existed in the Edgar Rice Burroughs universe. It all really is debatable because um, there are a lot of uh, a lot uh, that come close to that in coolness and that any one fan of the Edgar Rice Burroughs universe might think are cooler than the ones uh, or more awesome than the ones I've just listed. Uh, but feel free to leave a comment about which vehicles in the Edgar Rice Burroughs universe you like best. Thank you for listening. Please make a point of uh, finding the other episodes of the Edgar Rice Burroughs podcast, especially the full-length ones where Scott and Jess uh, are able to contribute enormously, uh, making them much better than these little ones I do alone. But I hope you have enjoyed this. Thank you for listening.